Hello and welcome, Brandon here. Thanks for choosing my video. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you think someone you know can also benefit by watching, please share. And as always, please subscribe. I appreciate it very much. So let's go ahead and get started. So here we are in video three. Now I will say right up front that this video gets a bit mathy, but this is statistics and that is bound to happen eventually. But rest assured, we will go through it very slowly using some diagrams and graphs to make it easier to understand. Now, the whole reason for this video even existing is due to a characteristic of logistic regression we talked about before. Our dependent variable is binary. It's either zero or it's one. Now, what we have to do is figure out a way to link our probabilities, which exist between zero and one, back to our independent variables. And that's what this video is really about. So the dependent variable in logistic regression, that's either one or zero, remember, follows the Bernoulli distribution. And you may remember that from when you were studying the binomial distribution. And in the case of logistic regression, the probability P is unknown. So remember that the Bernoulli distribution is just a special case of the binomial distribution where N equals one, so just one trial. Success is labeled a one and failure is labeled zero. So the probability of success is P and failure is Q, which is equal to one minus P. Now we've seen that before in the previous video. Remember in odds, P is on top and then below that we have one minus P. So in the context of Bernoulli, the odds are P divided by Q because mathematically they're the same thing. Now this is bold for a reason. So in logistic regression, we are estimating an unknown probability, P, for any given linear combination of the independent variables. So think about the two examples we've talked about up to now. So in the sleep apnea example, let's say I weighed 175 pounds. I wish I still did. By using my body weight, we could estimate the probability that I would have sleep apnea based on the data. Now what about our home mortgage example? If I walk into the bank with a 735 credit score, I could use our model to estimate the probability that I would be approved for a mortgage. So we have pretty much anything on the independent variable side of the regression, but on the dependent variable side, we have probabilities. And somehow we have to tie those two things together. And that's what this video is about. So therefore we need to link together our independent variables to essentially the Bernoulli distribution on the dependent side. And that link is called the logit. Now I will briefly say something about the pronunciation of that word logit. I've heard other people say logit and really I don't care, but I think the proper way is to say logit, but I'll probably slip and say logit. So just know that logit is technically the correct way to say it. So, what is the logit? So in logistic regression, we do not know P. We do not know the probability like we do in the binomial or the Bernoulli distribution problems. So the goal of logistic regression is to estimate the probability P for a linear combination of the independent variables. Now the estimate of P or the estimate of the probability is written as P hat. So it's P with a little hat over the top. So to tie together our linear combination of variables or independent variables, and in essence, the Bernoulli distribution, we need a function that links them together or sort of maps the linear combination of variables that could result in any value onto the Bernoulli distribution that has a domain from zero to one, just like our probabilities do. So the natural log of the odds ratio the logit is that link function. So we had the natural log of the odds. We talked about what the odds were in the last video. We could rewrite that in its natural form. So the natural log of P divided by one minus P. Now this is called the logit of P, the logit of the probability or the log odds. We could also write it this way, natural log of P minus the natural log of one minus P given the laws of logarithms. So we could just undo the division, 
create subtraction, and it's the same thing. You might see it either way. Now, just a reminder that log base E is the same thing as the natural logarithm. So depending on the book you're using, you may see it written log base E, but in most books, you'll see it written as the natural logarithm. Now, one thing I always like to do is make a graph of these functions so I can learn about them. So let's go ahead and look at a graph of the logit. So as I mentioned before, I love making graphs of these functions because just by looking at the graph, you can learn quite a lot. So what is very apparent right off the bat? Well, it looks like our function goes down to zero where the y axis is, but never really touches the y axis. So it seems like it's undefined at zero. What about over at one? So when P is one, it looks like the function goes up to one, but never crosses it. So again, it looks like it's undefined there as well. So let's go ahead and verify our assumptions. So when P is zero there at the origin, we're going to substitute that into our equation over here on the left. So if P is zero, we're going to have zero divided by one minus zero. That's zero divided by one. So that is zero. And the natural log of zero is undefined. That's why it is undefined at zero. What about one over here on the right? So if P is one, we're going to have one divided by one minus one. Well, one minus one in the denominator is not very good. That's undefined. So our function is going to be undefined at zero and at one, which when we're dealing with probabilities is quite handy. So we call this the log odds. Now it has one more interesting characteristic. Look at P of 0.5. Well, when P is 0.5, it appears that our function is zero. Let's go ahead and substitute that back in over here on the left. So if P is 0.5, we're going to have 0.5 on the top divided by one minus 0.5 on the bottom. That's also 0.5. So that will evaluate to one inside the parentheses. So we're going to have the natural log of one. And guess what? The natural log of one is zero. So that's why our function crosses at the point 0.5 for the X and zero for the Y. So when the probabilities are even, that means we have even odds. And when the odds are even, the logit is zero. Now, if we graph this on a little bit different scale, on a smaller scale, we can see it a bit better. Let's go ahead and graph it like this. So again, we're going from zero to one. That's our domain. And if we kind of squish together the Y axis, we can see that it makes this very interesting function or what we call an S curve or a sigmoid curve. So by graphing the log odds or the logit function, we're getting very close to what we need to better understand logistic regression. So what is the inverse logit or the inverse log odds? Now in our logit link function graph from before zero to one ran along the X axis, but we want the probabilities to be on the Y axis. And we can achieve that by taking the inverse of the logit function. So here we have the logit we had before. It's the natural log of the odds where P is between zero and one. Now we take the inverse of that. So the inverse logit, we end up with this. So remember E is a constant. It's the Euler number and it is pronounced Euler, but I'm going to say E whenever I read it in a function. So we go ahead and take the inverse of the logit or the inverse of the log odds, and we end up with e to the sum number alpha divided by one plus e to some number alpha. So that is just the inverse of the function on the left. Now in our case, this sum number will be the linear combination of independent variables and their coefficients. So the inverse logit will return the probability of being a one or in the event occurs group. So remember our dependent variable is either zero or one. So this inverse logit or the inverse log odds will give us the probability of being a one. Now this is sometimes called the mean function and it means the exact same thing. So the mean of Y given X is equal to the inverse logit we have up here. So I just wanted to write it down here because depending on what book you're using, you may see it written this way here in the orange, or you may see it written this way up here in the top right. Either way, it's the same thing. Now, of course, you know me, 
I love to make graphs of these functions. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for the inverse logit. So here's the graph of the inverse logit. Now, if this looks like our previous graph, but just tilted on its side 90 degrees, you are correct. We basically swapped the X and Y coordinates. So instead of zero to one on the X axis, we now have zero to one on the Y axis. So it's undefined at zero on the Y and undefined at one on the Y. And then it crosses the Y axis at 0.5, whereas before it crossed the X axis at 0.5. So we just turned the previous graph on its side by taking its inverse. So if we look at the inverse logit on a smaller scale, that looks like this. So again, we have our undefined points at zero on the y-axis on our top undefined point at one on the y-axis, and it crosses at 0.5, as you can see there in the middle. And this is the sigmoid function curve or the S curve that you're familiar with or may have seen before. And if you happen to have read anything else about logistic regression, you know that this shape is very important. And let's look at how that is in a rough sketch on the next slide. So here we are back to our original scatter plot. So this is what we saw in the very first video. So remember we have our FICO score or credit score along the bottom on the X axis, and we have being approved or not approved over on the Y axis. Now you notice that most of the approvals are shifted over to the right on this graph. So it looks like a solid blue line at the top is actually a series of many dots, but they are shifted kind of over to the right. Now along the bottom, we have the applications that were not approved and they're kind of all over the place. So they're not really on one side or the other. They're kind of all along the credit score range. Now what we're going to be able to do when we do this problem out in mini tab, or you could do it in anything else, we are going to be able to develop an estimated regression equation that fits the inverse logit model and uses the coefficients our analysis gives back to us. And it will end up looking something like this. So when we get our estimated regression equation back from Minitab or whatever else we use, we're gonna be able to take the coefficients that it generates, put them into that estimated regression model, and when we plot them, we are going to get a shape that looks like this. And think about what this says. What this says is that if you have a lower credit score, you are less likely to get approved for your mortgage. As your credit score increases, the probability goes up that you're gonna get approved for your mortgage. And that should make sense. So a note about the coefficients in logistic regression. So the regression coefficients for logistic regression are calculated using what's called maximum likelihood estimation or MLE. It's kind of like least squares regression that we did in the other types, but it uses an entirely different algorithm to figure out the coefficients. So discussing MLE for the coefficients is way beyond Statistics 101, so I will not be going over it. So MLE does tie a few things together behind the scenes, but for now we will just let it do its thing. It's one of those things going on sort of under the hood that we're not going to worry about. Now, if you'd like to learn more about it, feel free to do so. But for this video series, we will not be going into it. So finally, let's talk about the estimated regression equation for logistic regression. Remember, we're trying to find the estimated probability. So we're solving for P. We're solving for the estimated probability P. So the natural logarithm of the odds ratio is equivalent to a linear function, a linear combination of the independent variables, the exact same way you saw them in simple regression and multiple regression. Now the anti-log of the logit function allows us to find the estimated regression equation. Basically what it says is the anti-log of the logit function allows us to solve for P, the probability, the estimated probability. So here we have the natural log of the odds is equal to a linear combination of the independent variables, the exact same way you saw them in simple regression and multiple regression. So the beta sub zero plus the beta one x one, that's exactly what you saw in the other types of linear regression. Now remember, what we're trying to do here is isolate P. So we wanna solve for P. Because in the end, what we're trying to do is estimate our probability. And to do that, we have to get P by itself. 
And we're going to do that using simple algebra and the rules of logarithms. So first we'll take the anti-log of everything. So by doing that, we now have P divided by one minus P on the left. And then we have E, the Euler constant, raised to the linear combination of independent variables. So beta zero plus beta one, X one. Now all we're going to do is continue solving for P using algebra. So we'll swing the one minus P over to the right hand side. Then we'll distribute. So we have everything times one minus everything times P. That's all we did there was distribute on the right hand side. Now we'll move the other term to the left hand side that also has the P. Then we'll factor, so we factor out a P, and then we just swing everything in the parentheses over to the right hand side. And lo and behold, we have the estimated regression equation for logistic regression. So P hat, so the estimated probability, equals E, the Euler constant, raised to the linear combination of independent variables, divided by one plus E, raised to the linear combination of independent variables. And when we get the coefficients back from our statistical software program, we can substitute the coefficients into this equation and it will give us the estimated probability for whatever numbers we put into this equation. So I think that's quite enough for now. Now in video four, we'll actually go in and run the regression. We'll look at the coefficients. We will put them into the estimated regression equation and learn about how to interpret the output. In this case, it'll be from Minitab, but any other program will give you similar output. So we'll stop here and I'll see you in video four.